Canto three. Bent like a laboring oar that toils in the surf of the ocean, bent but not broken by age was the form of the notary public. Shocks of yellow hair like the silken floss of the maize hung over his shoulders. His forehead was high and glasses with horn bows sat astride on his nose with a look of wisdom supernal. Father of 20 children was he, and more than a hundred children's children rode on his knee and heard his great watch tick. Four long years in the times of the war had he languished a captive, suffering much in an old French fort as the friend of the English. Now, though warrior grown without all guile or suspicion, ripe in wisdom was he but patient and simple and childlike. He was beloved by all and most of all by the children. For he told them tales of the Lou Garou in the forest and the goblin that came in the night to water the horses and of the white Latiche, the ghost of a child who unchristened died and was doomed to haunt unseen the chambers of children and how on Christmas Eve, the oxen talked in the stable and how the fever was cured by a spider shut up in a nutshell and of the marvelous powers of four-leaved clover and horseshoes with whatsoever else was writ in the lore of the village. Then uprose from his seat by the fireside Basil the blacksmith, knocked from his pipe the ashes and slowly extending his right hand. Father Leblanc, he exclaimed, thou hast heard the talk in the village and perchance canst tell us some news of these ships and their errand. Then with modest demeanor made answer the notary public. Gossip enough have I heard in sooth, yet am never the wiser. And what their errand may be, I know not better than others. Yet am I not of those who imagine some evil intention brings them here for who we are at peace, and why then molest us? God's name, shouted the hasty and somewhat irascible blacksmith. Must we in all things look for the how and the why and the wherefore? Daily injustice is done, and might is the right of the strongest. But without heeding his warmth, continued the notary public. Man is unjust, but God is just, and finally justice triumphs. And well I remember a story that often consoled me when, as a captive, I lay in the old French fort at Port Royal. This was the man, old man's favorite tale, and he loved to repeat it, when his neighbors complained that any injustice was done them. Once in an ancient city, whose name I no longer remember, raised aloft on a column, a brazen statue of justice stood in the public square, upholding the scales in his, its left hand and in its right a sword as an emblem that justice presided over the laws of the land and the hearts and homes of the people. Even the birds had built their nests in the scales of the balance having no fear of the sword that flashed in the sunshine above them. But in the course of time, the laws of the land were corrupted. Might took the place of right, and the weak were oppressed, and the mighty ruled with an iron rod. Then it chanced in a nobleman's palace that a necklace of pearls was lost, and ere long a suspicion fell on an orphan girl who lived as maid in the household. She, after form of trial, condemned to die on the scaffold patiently met her doom at the foot of the statue of justice. As to her father in heaven, her innocent spirit ascended. Lo, or the city, a tempest rose and the bolts of the thunder smote the statue of bronze and hurled in wrath from its left hand down on the pavement below the clattering scales of the balance and in the hollow thereof was found the nest of a magpie into whose clay built walls the necklace of pearls was inwoven. Silenced but not convinced when the story was ended, the blacksmith stood like a man who fain would speak but findeth no language. All his thoughts were congealed into lines on his face as the vapors freeze in fantastic shapes on the window panes in the winter. Then Evangeline lighted the brazen lamp on the table, filled till it overflowed the pewter tankard with home-brewed nut-brown ale that was far famed for its strength in the village of Grand Prix. While from his pocket the notary drew his papers and inkhorn, wrote with a steady hand the date and the age of the parties, naming the dower of the bride in flocks of sheep and in cattle. 
orderly all things proceeded and duly and well were completed and the great seal of the law was set like a sun on the margin. Then from his leathern pouch, the farmer threw on the table three times the old man's fee in solid pieces of silver. And the notary rising and blessing the bride and the bridegroom lifted aloft the tankard of ale and drank to their welfare. Wiping the foam from his lip, he solemnly bowed and departed. While in silence, the others sat and mused by the fireside till Evangeline brought the draft board out of its corner. Soon was the game begun. In friendly contention, the old men laughed at each lucky hit or unsuccessful maneuver, laughed when a man was crowned or a breach was made in the king row. Meanwhile, apart in the twilight gloom of a window's embrasure, sat the lovers and whispered together, beholding the moonrise over the pallid sea and the silvery mist of the meadows. Silently, one by one, in the infinite meadows of heaven, blossom the lovely stars, the forget-me-nots of the angels. Thus was the evening passed. Anon the bell from the belfry rang out the hour of nine, the village curfew, and straightway rose the guests and departed, and silence reigned in the household. Many a farewell word and sweet good night on the doorstep lingered long in Evangeline's heart and filled it with gladness. Careful then were covered the embers that glowed on the hearthstone, and on the oaken stairs resounded the tread of the farmer. Soon, with a soundless step, the foot of Evangeline followed up the staircase, moved a luminous space in the darkness, lighted less by the lamp than the shining face of the maiden. Silent, she passed the hall and entered the door of her chamber. Simple that chamber was, with its curtains of white and its closed press, ample and high, on whose spacious shelves were carefully folded linen and woolen stuffs by the hand of Evangeline Woven. This was the precious dower she would bring to her husband in marriage, better than flocks and herds being proofs of her skill as a housewife. Soon she extinguished her lamp for the mellow and radiant moonlight streamed through the windows and lighted the room to the heart of the maiden swelled and obeyed its power like the tremulous tides of the ocean. Ah, she was fair, exceeding fair to behold, as she stood with naked snow-white feet on the gleaming floor of her chamber. Little she dreamed that below, among the trees of the orchard, waited her lover and watched for the gleam of her lamp and her shadow. Yet were her thoughts of him, and at times a feeling of sadness passed o'er her soul as the sailing shade of clouds in the moonlight flitted across the floor and darkened the room for a moment. And as she gazed from the window, she saw serenely the moon pass forth from the folds of a cloud, and one star follow her footsteps, as out of Abraham's tent young Ishmael wandered with Hagar. Canto 4 Pleasantly rose next morn the sun on the village of Grand Prix. Pleasantly gleamed in the soft, sweet air the basin of Mindless. The ships with their wavering shadows were riding at anchor. Life had long been astir in the village, and clamorous labor knocked with its hundred hands at the golden gates of the morning. Now from the country around, from the farms and neighboring hamlets, came in their holiday dresses the blithe Acadian peasants. Many a glad good morrow and jocund laugh from the young folk made the bright air brighter as up from the numerous meadows, where no path could be seen but the track of wheels in the greensward, group after group appeared and joined or passed on the highway. Long ere noon in the village, all sounds of labor were silenced. Thronged were the streets with people and noisy groups at the house doors sat in the cheerful sun and rejoiced and gossiped together. Every house was an inn where all were welcomed and feasted. For with this simple people who lived like brothers together, all things were held in common and what one had was another's. Yet under Benedict's roof, hospitality seemed more abundant for Evangeline stood among the guests of her father. Bright was her face with smiles, and words of welcome and gladness fell from her beautiful lips and blessed the cup as she gave it. Under the open sky, in the odorous air of the orchard, stripped of its golden fruit, was spread the feast of betrothal. There, in the shade of the porch, were the priest and the notary seated. There, good Benedict sat, and sturdy Basil the blacksmith. Not far withdrawn from these, by the cider press and the beehives, Michael the fiddler was placed, with the gayest of hearts and of waistcoats. 
Shadow and light from the leaves alternately played on his snow white hair as it waved in the wind, and the jolly face of the fiddler glowed like a living coal when the ashes are blown from the embers. Gaily the old man sang to the vibrant sound of his fiddle, Tous les bourgeois de Chartes and the Carillon de Dunkerque. Dunkerque? And anon with his wooden shoes beat time to the music. Merrily, merrily whirled the wheels of the dizzying dances under the orchard trees and down the path to the meadows. Old folk and young together and children mingled among them. Fairest of all the maids was Evangeline, Benedict's daughter. Noblest of all the youths was Gabriel, son of the blacksmith. So passed the morning away, and lo, with a summons sonorous, sounded the bell from its tower, and over the meadows a drum beat, thronged ere long with, was the church with men. Without in the churchyard waited the women. They stood by the graves and hung on the headstones, garlands, garlands of autumn leaves and evergreens fresh from the forest. Then came the guard from the ships, and marching proudly among them, entered the sacred portal. With loud and dissonant clangor echoed the sound of their brazen drums from ceiling and casement, echoed a moment only, and slowly the ponderous portal closed, and in silence the crowd awaited the will of the soldiers. Then uprose their commander and spoke from the steps of the altar, holding aloft in his hands with its seals the royal commission. You are convened this day, he said, by his majesty's orders, Clement and kind has he been, but how you have answered his kindness, let your own hearts reply. To my natural make and my temper painful the task as I do, which to you I know must be grievous. Yet must I bow and obey and deliver the will of our monarch, namely that all your lands and dwellings and cattle of all kinds forfeited be to the crown, and that you yourselves from this province be transported to other lands. God grant you may dwell there ever as faithful subjects, a happy and peaceable people. Prisoners now, I declare you, for such is his majesty's pleasure. As when the air is serene in sultry solstice of summer, suddenly gathers a storm and the deadly sling of the hailstones beats down the farmer's corn in the field and shatters his windows, hiding the sun and strewing the ground with thatch from the house roofs, bellowing fly the herds and seek to break their enclosures, so on the hearts of the people descended the words of the speaker. Silent a moment they stood in speechless wonder and then rose louder and ever louder a wail of sorrow and anger, and by an impulse moved they madly rushed to the doorway. Vain was the hope of escape, and cries and fierce imprecations rang through the house of prayer, and high o'er the heads of the others rose with his arms uplifted the figure of Basil the blacksmith, as on a stormy sea a spar is tossed by the billows. Flushed was his face and distorted with passion, and wildly he shouted, Down with the tyrants of England! We never have sworn them allegiance! Death to these foreign soldiers who seize on our homes and our harvests! More he fain would have said, but the merciless hand of a soldier smote him upon the mouth and dragged him down to the pavement. In the midst of the strife and tumult of angry contention, lo, the door of the chancel opened, and Father Felician entered with serious mien and ascended the steps of the altar. Raising his reverent hand with a gesture, he awed into silence all that clamorous throng, and thus he spake to his people. Deep were his tones and solemn, in accents measured and mournful, spake he as, after the Tussin's alarum, distinctly the clock strikes. What is this ye, that ye do, my children? What madness has seized you? Forty years of my life have I labored among you and taught you, not in word alone, but in deed, to love one another. Is this the fruit of my toils, of my vigils and prayers and privations? Have you so soon forgotten all lessons of love and forgiveness? This is the house of the Prince of Peace, and would you profane it thus with violent deeds and hearts overflowing with hatreds? Lo, where the crucified Christ from his cross is gazing upon you? See in those sorrowful eyes what meekness and holy compassion. Hark how those lips still repeat the prayer, O Father, forgive them. Let us repeat that prayer in the hour when the wicked assail us. Let us repeat it now and say, O Father, forgive them. 
Few were his words of rebuke, but deep in the hearts of his people sank they, and sobs of contrition succeeded the passionate outbreak, while they repeated his prayer and said, O oh, Father, forgive them. Then came the evening surface. The tapers gleamed from the altar. Fervent and deep was the voice of the priest, and the people responded, not with their lips alone, but their hearts, and the Ave Maria sang them, and fell on their knees, and their souls with devotion translated rose on the ardor of prayer like Elijah ascending to heaven. Meanwhile had spread in the village the tidings of ill, and on all sides wandered wailing from house to house the women and children. Long at her father's door Evangeline stood with her right hand shielding her eyes from the ray level rays of the sun that descending lighted the village street with mysterious splendor and roofed each peasant's cottage with golden thatch and emblazoned its windows. Long within had been spread the snow-white cloth on the table. There stood the wheaten loaf and the honey fragrant with wildflowers. There stood the tankard of ale and the cheese fresh brought from the dairy. And at the head of the board, the great armchair of the farmer. Thus did Evangeline wait at her father's door as the sun set through the long shadows of trees or the broad ambrosial meadows. Ah, on her spirit within, a deeper shadow had fallen and from the fields of her soul a fragrance celestial ascended, charity, meekness, love, and hope, and forgiveness, and patience. Then, all forgetful of self, she wandered into the village, cheering with looks and words the mournful hearts of the women, as o'er the darkening fields with lingering steps they departed, urged by their household cares and the weary feet of their children. Down sank the great red sun, and in golden glimmering vapors, veiled the light of his face like the prophet descending from Sinai. Sweetly over the village, the bell of the Angelus sounded. Meanwhile, amid the gloom by the church, Evangeline lingered. All was silent within, and in vain at the door and the windows stood she and listened and looked till overcome by emotion. Gabriel, cried she aloud with tremulous voice, but no answer, came from the graves of the dead, nor the gloomier grave of the living. Slowly at length she returned to the tenantless house of her father, smoldered the fire on the hearth, on the board was the supper untasted, empty and dear was each room, and haunted with phantoms of terror. Sadly echoed her step on the stair and the floor of her chamber. In the dead of the night she heard the disconsolate rainfall, loud on the withered leaves of the sycamore tree by the windows. Keenly the lightning flashed, and the voice of the echoing thunder told her that God was in heaven and governed the world he created. Then she remembered the tale she had heard of the justice of heaven. Soothed was her troubled soul, and she peacefully slumbered till morning.